our God is such an awesome God. Let's continue to worship.
here this morning. I, I, I did not come through that door. I wish I had because I came to see Jesus. Amen. Not the one that is painted there, but my Savior, the awesome God that we just sang about. Amen. And we're so glad you did that. It's fine. I'm so glad that you're here. Um, for us to know that you're here, I want you to do something. I want you to reach in your pocket right now. Go ahead, reach in your pocket. Grab your phones out. I'm going to do like I do with the students. Grab your phones. Uh, you know you have it. Come on, bring it out. I want to see it. Put it in the air and wave it like you don't care. Come on, bring those phones out. Let's go. Come on. There will be a QR code in the screen. You open your camera. If you have an iPhone, if you have an Android, I don't know what you do, but try to scan as, as good as you can. One day you accept Jesus, you find salvation in the ease of use of the iPhone. All right, and then you scan the code, one per family. Just go ahead, go ahead, do it, do it now. Don't wait, I'll do it later. You won't do it later, do it now, come on. I saw three phones up. We're never gonna know who's here. Not even my wife did it. <laughs> but we'd love to know that you're here. Why? Because, you know, it's important for us to know that you're here. Because if you're not here, then we have to follow up with you and then check on you to make sure that you're, everything's going good with you. That's why I tell our students, if you don't check in and I know that you're not here, I'm going to call you and say, hey, why are you not here? And they're like, uh, I was there. Well, you didn't check in. Now you make me look stupid. <laughs> so um, check in. And if you're watching online, which camera should I look to? That one, that one. If you're watching us online, I'm so glad that you're watching us from the comfort of your home, but we'd love for you to be here. Um, Brother, Brother Thrower always gives us the address by telling you of the seventh light. Is that right? I, I don't know. That's why I never do the announcements. They, one block south of traffic light seven. Or you can type on your GPS the address for the church, and it will bring you here a lot better than my directions. So, but we'd love to, for you to be here with us so that we can, you know, shake your hand. And if you're a hugger, hug your neck, doing stuff like that, we'd love for you to do that. Um, and if you're first time here with us, we're so glad. You're a special guest. In the end of our service, we'd love for you to um, go to our, our pastor's reception. Um, you know, if you're just like, I don't know how to get there. It, you just go out through these doors to your left and then to your right and then there'll be somebody there waiting on you. If you're coming from the top, you just go down the stairs to, to your right, and it's straight across. That's it. Thank you. Um, I'll do you one better visit. Like, guess there's somebody sitting next to you that's coming here all the time, and they know how to get there. Members, if you, if you see somebody that you don't know, introduce yourself to them. It's okay. Shake their hand, take them out for lunch, and then bring them to the pastor's reception. That was much better that way. And then you can pay for their lunch too. Oh, I'm supposed to tell you that you can also give online. Yes, in the same spot right there. It will take you to, this, to the place that you can give. Your, 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 tithes, your tithes and offerings are very important because that's how we keep things going. That's how we take students to camp. That's how we take children to camp. That's how we continue to minister to our community. That's how we continue to reach and advance with the gospel. So when you give... You empower all those things. Also, you empower missionaries that are across the world doing the, the work of the kingdom. So give online. I think that's all. I'm supposed to bring the ushers now. I see the hand motions. We're supposed to be called forward. Come on, guys. Come on down. Brother Clay, if you're watching, I'm sorry. I'm still in VBS mode. John was supposed to have the horn going up there, but it's okay. <laughs> he said, I, I like my job. It's on. Heavenly Father, thank you for this beautiful day you've given us. God, thank you for just being an awesome God to us and for us. Um, God, be with Brother Carlos and Brother, Brother Bob as they prepare to lead our, our worship service today. And uh, at this time, I want to bless the givers of the church. Help them to give with a joyful heart. Lord, help us to, to raise these tithes and offerings up to you so that we can glorify 
your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together and continue to lift our praises and lift our worship to express our faith, to proclaim our faith in Christ to the world. There's no place like that place of surrender that, that's at the, that place of the cross where we see Jesus more clearly, where we surrender to him and submit to him. There's a place
now super quiet. You know something that's really awkward? Silence. <laughs> Maybe that's why we don't hear from God a lot, because we, d we don't like silence. So, let's enjoy that moment of awkward for a second. Because here's the thing that I know, a topic that's, super prominent in our lives. I mean, you, you can lie in church, it's okay, but I know every, each one of us, at one point or another, have become afraid of something. Perhaps you're, you're, you're afraid of the dark, perhaps you're afraid of, you know, a new job, a new school, a, a, a transition that is happening in your life, or you know, a move that's about to happen in your life or the expectations of what the future is supposed to bring. If you're one of those that, that's into politics, perhaps politics is something that brings you fear and anxiety and you're just sitting there and then all of a sudden you're thinking about your finances and then your finances are like, what am I going to do? How is this going to happen? And now all of a sudden you're fearful and then you linger onto that fear for a long time. And then our lives become this this turmoil. And in the midst of that storm, in the midst of those uncertainties, um, we need to rely on our God. We need to claim on, on the promises that he gave us. We need to rely on him. And uh, let me tell you a story. Just this week, you know, preachers, you think, oh, by the way, I'm supposed to tell you, Brother Clay is at the Southern Baptist Convention. Before, before I get, forget, he would not no, let me leave that down. He is, he's in New Orleans trying to fix the Southern Baptist Convention. <laughs> so, <laughs> I got some brownie points there. Uh, but anyway, let me tell you a story. You, you think of preachers, you know, and preachers are like, oh, you know, they're, everything goes right for them. They're always in tune with God. They, they, they never struggle. That's a lie. Let me tell you, this, just this week, I was super afraid. I was very fearful, and before I preached this sermon to you guys, I had to preach this sermon to myself, okay? Because I was sitting there, and I was struggling. I was anxious. Um, it, he was like, why are you struggling? I was like, you know, this will be like my first preaching time anniversary today, right? It, if you remember this, last year, you guys voted for me to come, and then we had VBS, which was crazy, and then we got to the end of VBS, and I had to preach. So a year from today was the first time I preached here. Um, and ever since, we've been looking for a home for us to buy. Or land, by the way. Hint, hint, if you have one of those, come talk to me. Because this week I was very afraid. Our landlord came to us and she said, you know what, I want to sell the house. You can, you can buy the house if you want to. Or, well, you can't afford the house, of course. She wants a little bit too much. Um, <laughs> but I was afraid. I was like, how are we going to do this? Where am I going to put my family? You know, God, you brought us all the way from, from where we were. We were comfortable. We had our own home. We loved our home. It was amazing. And then here we are in, in a foreign land for us still. I mean, we're still trying. This is supposed to be our Canaan, right? Our, our promised land. And then we, we got here, and now I'm fearful. It's like, where am I going to do it with my children? Where, where, am I, where am I going to go? I mean, we're about to get kicked out in three months, and we don't have a place for us to go. And we decided, hey, let's just, let's just go ahead, and we, we found a place we can, we can probably build. And the guy said, well, it's going to take you like a whole year. I'm like, oh, I don't have a year. I have three months. Um, and then when he quoted us the price for the build, we were just like, yeah, no. I can't afford that. So I began, I began to wrestle with God and say, God, why? Why are you doing this? Why are, you, why are you causing us to go through this? And I was anxious. And let me tell you, in my, in my anxiety, in my fears, you know, a lot of times we lash out. When you're afraid, you lash out. Yes. And then usually the, the, the people that suffer the most are the people that are next to us. The people that I'm trying to protect the most are the people that are suffering the most. 
I wanted, I wanted so much to make everything right for them, but it's out of my control. And I'm sitting there wrestling with God, and, you know, impressively enough, God uses things to speak to us, including VBS. One of the scripture verses was that Peter was, was, was out on the water. He's walking on water. His eyes is fixed on Jesus. Everything is going great until he loses sight of Jesus, and then he starts to sink. And I'm like, hmm. I wonder if that's what I'm doing. And then the next song that we sing the next day in VBS is all about don't be afraid. And then I decide to do my Bible study and I open my scripture and the first scripture that came out was like, don't be afraid. And then God kept telling me, it's like, listen, you're not alone. You're not, you're, <laughs> I did not just bring you and then just left you. I am always with you. And it's that promise that we have to remember this morning. And, and, and perhaps we can relate to, to one of the Bible characters that we're going to study this morning in Genesis chapter 32. If you have your Bibles, Genesis chapter 32. It is, it is the story of Jacob, you know, in his anxious heart. And it's one of the passages that, that God prompted in my, in my heart this week. You know, Jacob is preparing to meet his brother after he fled, scared from his brother that his brother was going to kill him. He, he, he was separated for a long time. He's carrying with him the burden of guilt and expectations of what is to come and a lot of fear in his heart. Jacob was a man of faith, but he found himself filled with fear as he's preparing to meet his brother. In case you don't know the story, you're sitting there, it's like, uh, I don't, I'm, never heard the story. Let me give you a quick recap. In case you're still looking for Genesis, it's like, it's one of the first books of the Bible. It's easy to find. Um, but here's the thing. Jacob was, he had a brother. And although they were twins, they were very different. Esau, his brother, was like me. He was hairy, you know. <laughs> Jacob was probably like one of them hairless guys that can grow a beard. Not everybody can grow a beard. Jacob liked to farm. Esau liked to hunt. So he's an outdoors man. But, but here's also in the story, we know that, you know, Jacob was so eager to come out that he came out grabbing the foot of his brother. like, don't let me hear. And then it's just like all together came out. That's why they gave him the name. And Isaac favored Esau, but Rebekah, the mother, she favored Jacob. And then Jacob was, was a very smart guy. It's like, hey, it, I was just like mere seconds behind this dude. I will, I will be the firstborn. And he kind of swindled his brother into, into selling his, his birthright for, for a bowl of stew. That must be some good stew right there. Let me tell you. But he did. And then right before his dad is ready to give the blessing, the ultimate blessing, the passing the baton to his next, to the son, you know, he decided, it's like, hey, um, we can do this. I can, I can take that blessing for myself. So he gets into his brother's clothes, and he starts smelling like his brother, and he takes, like, the, uh, this dish to his, his dad, and his dad looks at him, and it's like, I don't know. They they're look so much alike because they're twins, by the way. Don't miss this. They're twins. And, and, and the dad's like, well, come closer. Let me, let me give you a kiss. And he comes closer, and now he's wearing his brother's clothes, so the dead smells like, yeah, you smell like the outdoors. I don't know if that was a compliment or, you know, but he, he was just like, you smell like my, my son Esau. And then, and then he eats, and then he blesses, he blesses the brother, right? He, brought, he blesses Jacob. And, 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 and as he's doing this, the other brother comes home and um, brings his dad the stew, and he's like, all right, I'm ready for my blessing, Dad. And it's like, hey, who are you? I don't know you. It's like, I'm your son. It's like, wait, that's not possible. Somebody already took the blessing, already blessing. And he's like, wait, Dad, you only have one blessing? It's like, hey, I already gave him everything. What else do you want? So he struggles there. So now Esau is really mad, right? He got swindled by his brother twice. He's out for revenge. So his mother, he, Rebecca, catch wind of what's about to happen. It's like, hey, you need to get out of here. You need to pack your stuff, and you need to, she said like this on verse 20, uh, 
verse 42 on, on chapter 27 says, listen, your brother is consoling himself by planning to kill you. So now, my son, listen to me, flee at once to my brother Laban in Haran. And then stay there for just a few days or until your brother and your brother's anger subsides, until your brother's rage turns away from you and he forgets what you have done. So Rebecca thought that was just going to be a few days. You just go hang out with, with your uncle. Everything's going to be fine. Little she know that she would never see her son again. The anger burned in the heart of Esau for a long time. And the fear continued to to startle in, in Jacob's heart. But here's the thing. What, what, what I need to for us to understand what the fear that Jacob was feeling, what it did to him, and how it affected him. The first thing that we see, if, you, if you're in your notes, I'm going to give you the words because I didn't put it on the screen so that you can pay attention. All right, you ready? Jacob's fear affected his state of mind. His state of mind. He was afraid. And, and it reads like this on verse 7. You should, you should have it right there. It says, um, when the messenger returned to Jacob, they said, he, we went to your brother Esau, and he's coming to meet you with 400 men. And in verse 7, it says like this, and then Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed. So he divided the people with him in two camps along with the flocks, the herds, the camels. And then he thought if Esau comes in one camp and attacks, the other one can escape. He was, he was distressed. His mind was clouded by, by what he could see or by what he could imagine that could happen. So he started dividing everything. But, you know, Jacob, that was not just that one experience. If we go back into, into time, Jacob's ears in Haran was, was hard. He was swindled by his, by his uncle. He's like, hey, I want to marry your daughter. And there's like, okay, work for me seven years and everything's going to be great. Gave him the wrong daughter. I don't know how he missed that one, but he did. I don't know how they did marriages back then, but somehow he didn't know. So he worked another seven years for, for his uncle so he can marry the other daughter, right? And, then, and he must have longed to return home. If you, if you lived in the same town for a long time and you never left Lexington, Tennessee, um, you might not understand this, but once you go somewhere and you live somewhere where you don't belong, you just long to go back home. You just long for the familiarities of the things that you know, for your friends that you left behind, for the people that you left behind. You long for those things. He must have longed so much to come back home. But, but his fear of his brother have kept him for, from coming and from doing so. It's like, I, I want to go so much, but I am so afraid that if I go, he, it's not going to end up good for me. His fear was a bitter fruit in his cup. He was being blessed. No, nonetheless, he was living in a foreign land, but he was blessed every step of the way. Every time that his, his father-in-law, uncle, uncle, how, how, I don't know, uncle, father-in-law, how, I don't know how that works, but his father-in-law was trying to change something on the deal that they made, God would bless him right? God will bless Jacob. And Jacob is, it is being blessed tremendously. So, so, but he also had this bitterness that, that is clouding his mind. He, this distress that's been growing. It's like, I want to go home, but if I do, I might lose my life. And then through all this, he's dealing with God and God is taking care of him. God, through every step that Jacob took, God said, I am with you. Don't forget that I am with you. Don't forget that I am with you. Fear brought him a chronic distress, a chronic distress. The more we fear, the more we stress, the more we stress, the more anxious we become. I hope you understand this. It, it doesn't start, the anxiety doesn't start at once. It started with a little bit of fear. And then as long as we allow that fear to percolate in our lives, we, we, become, we become stressed out about it. And the more we, don't, we leave that behind, and it's like, I'm just going to deal with stress by not thinking about it, the more that becomes anxiety that takes over our lives. The Bible talks about anxiety, and it says like this, anxiety weighs our hearts down. When you're feeling anxious, your hearts, it's, they're pulling down. It's just like it's getting, all the life is getting sucked out of you. You ever felt that way before? I know I felt this way this week. It's like that life is being sucked out of me. 
I felt so anxious. My physical and my emotional well-being was being affected. And every time that we allow the anxiety, the, the fear to build up to anxiety, we will have our hearts weighed down. But the, the Bible says like this in Proverbs 12, 25, it says, anxiety in a person's hearts weigh it down, but a good word cheer them up. Good word. What is the good word? In case you're still wondering, what is the good word? Here's the good word. Because as soon as I was anxious and I was dealing with all that fear, when, when the good word of God came to me, my anxiety seems to subside. A lot of times we try to muscle through things when we should deal with them, with God on our side. We're just like, I can do this on my own. Every time I tell, this is me, okay? Every time I'm saying I'm going to do this my way, I become more fearful, more stressed, more anxious. But when I rely on God and let God deal with those things, then everything just seems calm. It's the peace in the middle of the storm. Anxiety will rob us of our inner peace. It will rob us of our inner peace. Jesus says like this, peace I live with you. My peace I give you. I do not give you as the world gives. Don't let your heart be troubled and fearful. Don't let your heart be troubled and fearful. God, through Jesus, is giving us peace. Peace. But once we allow the anxiety, it will rob us of our peace. Our anxiety is, is ineffective. You can be anxious all day and nothing can come out of your anxiety. The Bible in Matthew 6, 27 says, Can you add a single moment to your lifespan by worrying? No. Every time that we spend time worrying, nothing's happening. We're just getting stressed out and more worry. I hope you understand this because you, it, it affects us in so many ways. It impacts our relationships with our families. It impacts our relationship with everybody around us, with our friends, with our families. Because you know what? When you're anxious and when you're stressed, when, you, when you're fearful, you lash out on the people that you love the most. Your anxiety affects your relationship with God. Your relationship with God. It hinders your trust and your surrender, making it difficult for you to trust God's plan and surrender to God's guidance and his provision. It's impossible for me to trust God when I am so anxious and trying to muscle through myself. It's impossible for me to rely on his plans when I believe that my plans are better than his plans. And I hope you understand this. God has the best in mind for you and for me. His plans are for us to prosper. Those are the promises in the Bible, not my promises, not my word. This is his promises. And in the times of anxiety, in the times of stress, we need to rely upon the promises that God has given us. Proverbs chapter 3, verses six, 5 and 6 says like this, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not rely on your own understanding. In all your ways, know him, and he will make your paths straight. It doesn't say that if, if you rely on him, you're going to make your path straight. No, no, he's going to make our path straight. We got we to gotta trust in the Lord with everything. But if I'm anxious about something, and I'm not, re, I'm not relying on God. So Jacob's fear affected his mind, his mindset. He was, he's not thinking straight. He's struggling, and he cannot see the clear picture. Because I hope you don't, don't miss this. He's not going home because he wanted to, just because he wanted to go home. He's going home because God told him it was time for him to go home. But he's still not seeing straight because the fear is affecting his state of mind. The fear was also affecting his spiritual life. It was affecting his spiritual life. Let's read verse 9. Then Jacob said, God of my father Abraham and God of my father Isaac, the Lord who said to me, go back to your land and to your family and I will cause you to prosper. I am unworthy of all the kindness and faithfulness that you have shown your servant. Indeed, I cross over the Jordan with my staff and now I have become two camps. Please rescue me from my brother Esau, for I am afraid of him. Otherwise, he may come and attack me. The mothers and the children. 
you have said, I will cause you to prosper, and I will make your offspring like the sand of the sea, too numerous to be counted. Do you see how it's affecting his faith? God had given him a clear promise, and it's affecting him. God had told him, return, don't be afraid, return. God told him that he had a promise to deal well with him, but he was afraid. God promised him, like, hey, I'm going to do you well. I am going to take care of you. Don't worry. Don't be afraid because I am your God. I am your God. He had a promise. God had been faithful to him in the past. And, and, and here's what happens in our anxiety. We forget how good our God has been to us. Think back. Think back. It's a very important lesson for us to learn. Look back in your troubles and your, your scares that you had in, in back, in, back in the days, right? The scares that you have in the past, and then see how God had brought you through all those little scares, all those little moments that you're, you're fearful, that you're anxious, that you stress out. See how your God has been faithful to you. And he, it is affecting his, his worship. When we allow anxiety and, and fear <coughs> to affect us, it affects our worship. Let me tell you about me. I, I was anxious this week. You know what I did? I praised God and prayed. Mm-mm. No, I didn't. I struggled. Let's sing a song. I don't want to sing a song to God right now. He's stressing me out. You do that too. Don't, don't judge me. I see your judging eyes. I said, let's pray. Mm-hmm. I don't want to talk with God right now. I'm pretty angry with him. Why? Why is he making me go through all this? It affected my worship. It affects your worship too. It does. Until the moment that you put your knees to the ground and you just say, hey, God, you know, I'm stressing. And he's like, I know. Uh, it, until you surrender to his plan, until you say, God, you know what? I, there's nothing I can do. You are sovereign God. You have everything in your hands. You, you sang the, the old songs like, you have the whole world in his hands. You, you sang that song before. You know that he has everything in his hands and everything happens for a reason and on purpose according to his will. But until we surrender to that will, we're going to continue to be stressed and we're going to continue to affect our worship. And it wasn't until I said, you know, God, let me put my knee to the ground and let me pray. Let me truly pray. That, that burden was just lifted out. He uses people in our lives to speak truth into our lives. Sometimes we're, it affects our worship so much that we don't even hear the messengers that God is sending to us. God is always bringing somebody to you to bring you back to him. God has been faithful in the past. Do you think that he's going to stop being faithful now? No. Note the contradiction between verse 11 and verse 12. Let's read it again. It says, it says like this, Please rescue me from my brother, for I am afraid otherwise he may come and attack me. And in verse 12 it says, You said that you could cause me to prosper and I will make an offspring like the sin. Here's the thing. Fear and faith cannot coexist. Fear and faith, they cannot coexist. Fear does not come from God. I hope you understand that. The fear does not come from God. God it says like this in, in 2 Timothy verse 1, in, uh, chapter 1, verse 7, it says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and in sound mind. Fear does not come from God. Fear is driven out by love. Once we comprehend the, the love that God has for me and the, the love that God has for you, once we understand that, we understand that that's going to drive away all our fears. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 18, it says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. When we're going through a storm, when we're feeling fearful and anxious, we fear that God is doing that to punish us. Which is very contrary to what he's telling us. He says, my love, my perfect love will push away your fear. Will you understand that I am here for you? And I'm putting you through some of those stuff. 
for a reason. I'll tell you what, when God puts me through the fire, my faith grows. When God puts me through the fire, my memory grows. My memory of how good God has been to me. When he puts me through the fire, the more love I feel because I know that my God is with me. So fear affected Jacob's state of mind. Fear affected his spiritual life. And also fear affected his handling of money. Let's continue to read on verse 13. It says, he spent the night there and he took part of what he had brought with him as a gift for his brother Esau. 200 female goats, 20 male goats, 200 ewe. That if, if, if you have that translation, I had to Google that word. It, it's sheep. Ew. I don't know if I said that right. <laughs> Maybe because they're ew. Anyway, so um, then 20 rams, then 30 milk camels with the young, 40 cows, 10 bulls, 20 female donkeys, 10 male donkeys, and he entrusted them to his to his slave as separate herds, and he said to them, go ahead of me and leave me some distance between the herds. And then he told them, the first one, when my brother Esau meets you and asks you, who do you belong to? Where are you going? And, and whose animals are these? Tell him they belong to your servant Jacob, and they're a gift. Send to my Lord Esau. And look, he's behind us. And he also told the second one and the third one and everyone who was walking behind the animals to say the same thing to his brother Esau when, <laughs> when you see him. So, so here's the thing. In verse 20 it says, And you also say, Look, for your servant is right behind us. For he thought, I want to appease Esau with the gifts that are going ahead of me. And after that, I can face him and perhaps he will forgive me. So the gifts was sent ahead of him while he remained in camp that night. And during the night, Jacob got up and took his two wives and his two slave women and his 11 sons and crossed the ford of Jabuk. Jab Close enough. And then he took them and then he sent them across the stream along with all his possessions. So he decided to send this large gift to his brother because he said, you know what? I'm going to do things my own way. Instead of trusting the promise that God had given him, he still chose to separate his possessions and, and then push them ahead of him. He decided that he still didn't trust God. He decided that, that he's going to take matters in his own, own hands. He was willing to sacrifice everything before he trusted the Lord. A lot of times, we, instead of trusting the Lord with our finances, we choose to sacrifice everything. Before we trust him with everything. This gift was not a gift of, of love. This was a gift of fear. It was a gift of fear. The most of us have suffered financially because of fear. We, we're afraid to invest. We, we're afraid to invest our time. We're afraid to invest our money. We're afraid, we're afraid to invest in God and in other people. We're afraid. We are afraid to, to give. A lot of times we're, we don't give because, I, I, hey, I've been there. I'm afraid to give because, you know, my budget's been so tight that if I give, then we may lose and we may not have enough. So I don't give. I'm afraid the economy may change. The president may do something crazy. And then now we don't have any money. How do I'm going to take care of my family? Maybe I shouldn't give, you know, because that 10% is going to hit me hard later. Let me tell you a story. Me and April, we decide early on that we will be givers and we will trust God with everything. It, is, it, is it hard sometimes? Yes, it is hard sometimes. And let me tell you, one, one time we did give all that we had and we had to pay bills and we were $100 short. Some of you are like, man, I carry a $100 bill in my pocket. I know, I don't. <laughs> I have nothing. If you shake me upside down and some money comes out, you can keep it. Because I don't have any. $100 short. And then we're sitting there stressing. And it's like, oh, how are we going to do this? And then we're just like, hey, we just got to rest on the Lord because he's going to take care of it. 
He told us to be givers. He told us to, to give and not stress about it because he is in control. We're going to rest. And we did. And, you know, I went to the mailbox, and I grabbed an envelope. And then in that envelope, which I should have been there, like, a few months before, was there at the right time. The mail service did us a solid that, that, that month. <laughs> not the mail service. It was God orchestrating all these things. And when we pop open that envelope, you, could you guess how much money was in there? $100. God is always taking care of us. He's always providing. But, but when we are afraid, we, we miss opportunities to invest. We miss opportunities to give. We miss great opportunities. But the greater tragedy is, is that the money that we choose to hold back or the money that we choose to blow in other things that could have been given to Christ to further his kingdom. It could have been projects in the church that we could have accomplished, kids that could be reached with the gospel, teenagers that could be reached with the gospel, missionaries that could be going out. But we choose to say, God, I am afraid of the economy. I'm afraid of everything that's going on. I am going to hold my money to myself because I don't trust you when I give you my money. I'm afraid. And let me tell you, when, and then, then we give a little bit to God. We don't give that out of a loving heart. We give that out of fear. And then we suffer financially. Why? Because of fear. Just like Jacob, fear ex affected his state of mind. Fear affected his spiritual life. Fear affected his handling of money. And then fear affected his family. Affected his family. Let's continue to read. It, we're going to skip the part that he wrestled with God. Because he still don't trust God. After he's done all that, he's still not trusting God. And then he's crossing. He's the last one, by the way. He's the last one. He sent everybody before him. And it's like, hey, I'm going to go last. Just in case somebody ambushes me. Right? Because I still don't trust. And he wrestles with God. And then he limps for the rest of his life. That should be a warning for us. You want to limp for the rest of your life? Wrestle with God. If you don't, just let it go. Let it go, let it go. Anyway, so well, let's move on. Chapter 33, verses 1 and 3. 1, 2, 3. It reads like this. Now Jacob looked up and he saw Esau coming toward him with 400 men. It should have like pause. Dun, dun, dun. And then he was afraid, the announcer will say. So he divided the children among Leah, Rachel, and the two slave women. And then he put the slaves and their children first, and then his second favorite wife, Leah, and her children next. And then he kept his favorite wife behind, Rachel, with Joseph being the last one. And he himself went ahead and bowed seven, seven times until he approached his brother. He's still afraid. Even after he wrestled with God, don't miss this. He spent all night fighting God and say, God, man, you got to bless me. And then God's like, no, you got to bless me. You promised me this. He's having his argument with God. Hey, I have one of these this week. Before he hit me on the socket, I let it go. And I say, God, this is your plan. I'm just going to trust you, right? But, but here's the thing. A lot of times we wrestle with God. And God is just saying, trust me. Trust me. And then even though the, he, he fought with God and he wrestled with God, Jacob saw his brother coming with 400 men, and he still didn't believe God. He's still afraid. He's ready to wrestle with God, but when, it, when the light shone and the music played, he was afraid once again. Fear divided his family. This is, he put his family in a distress that they should never been. But this is what fear does to us. It puts us in a distress that our families should never see. Our families should see us acting in faith, not in fear. Our families, they need to see us acting in faith, not in fear. Your children, your grandchildren, the people that are not your children, but there are children around you, they need to see you act in faith not in fear. Man. Wow, Carlos, that's hard stuff. How do we deal with all that? I'm glad you asked that question. Because overcoming fear involves a journey that requires faith and trust in God. 
faith and trust. Jacob's story teaches us that, that in the face of our fears, we have an amazing resource that so many of us take no advantage of it. Our faith in the God Almighty. By turning our eyes to God and placing our trust in His promises, we can overcome our fears while they're gripping our hearts. Trust. Have faith. How do you do this? Well, if you're taking notes, here are four things. Four things. Number one, seek God's presence. Seek God's presence. As you navigate the chaos and the noise of the world, take time to find a quiet place to spend time with God. You're going to continue to be anxious. You're going to continue to be fearful. You're going to continue to be stressed as long as you don't rely on God. How will you do that if you don't spend time with Him? So seek His presence. Pray. Read His Word. Meditate. I'm not talking about sitting there with your arms crossed, fingers like this, going, hum. That's not the kind of meditation we do. But it's when we read God's truth, we allow God's truth to percolate through our brains and then through our hearts. So when we're squeezed, what comes out of us, it is God. Allow his spirit to fill you with the peace that surpasses all understanding. If you are too busy to find time with God, you will fail. You will fail. And you fall into the trap of fear. Make time to be with God. Number two, trust his promises. Trust his promises. Stand firm in the belief that God will see you, see you through in our, your trials and your tribulations. While you're spending time with God, think about some verses like this. In Isaiah chapter 41, verses 10, it says, Don't be afraid, for I am with you. Do not be afraid, for I am your God. I will strengthen you, and I will help you, and I will hold on to you with my righteous right hand. Or perhaps if you want some more Psalms 55, 22, it says, Cast all your cares on the Lord, and he will sustain you. He will never let the righteous be shaken. That's not enough evidence. Then read Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 to 30. It says, Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take upon my yoke, and, and you will learn from me. And I'm a gentle and humble... And, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. You need more? I'll give you more. Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7 says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every, every, and I mean every situation, by prayer, petition, and thanksgiving, present your request to God. Present your request to God, and the peace of God, which it transcends us all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Jesus Christ. Oh, that's not enough, Carlos. Give me one more. Then I'm okay. The Bible's filled with times that God is saying, listen, trust in me. Trust. And he's calling us to trust. Because once we trust in him and we remember the promises that he made, God is not a God that breaks promises. He's a God that fulfills promises. So trust. Trust in him. Remember, number three, remember his perfect love. Remember his perfect love because God love, God's love will cast away your fears. We read that in 1 John chapter 4, verse 18. When we embrace his perfect love for us and we let it permeate in our hearts, our fears will fade away. So remember, his perfect love will cast away our fears. Number four, take action in your faith. Take action. A lot of us, we learn all this, we hear all this, this amazing stuff, and we hear the truth, and we hear everything, and we become just hearers of God's word instead of be doers of God's word. God is saying, hey, take action on your faith. Don't let your fear hold you back. Put your trust in God and step into, step into your faith and step out, just as Jacob did, knowing that the Lord had gone before him. Let us view these moments as opportunities to grow in our faith. Let us view these moments as opportunities to sharpen our, our, our skills and to strengthen our faith muscles. The meeting finally happens between the two brothers. The time arrives. 
Verse 4, it says, Then Esau ran to meet him, hugged him, and he threw his arms around him, and he kissed him, and they both wept. They embrace, and they wept. Esau has forgiveness, has forgiveness in his heart, and he forgave his brother long ago. Jacob's fears have been groundless. God was already preparing the way before he even knew that the way was being prepared. There is a way out of your storms. There is a way out of your fears, and God's already preparing that way out. He's just waiting on you to grab a hold of the help. Most of our fears are irrational. They're irrational. God is much, much bigger than all our fears. God is much bigger than any circumstances that we see ourselves in. Faith in Christ brings salvation. And in His salvation, we have protection every day. And I hope you don't miss this. In every moment, every moment we should place our faith in Christ. For us Christians, that should be a given. But if you never accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, perhaps today's the day. Perhaps it's the day that you've been so stressed, so fearful, you just don't know where to go. This is, you're, in, you're in the end of your rope. It's time for you to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. It's time for you to put your trust in Him. This week during VBS, we had 15 kids that took that step. 15. <laughs> they realize that they need to place their faith so that they can receive the guidance for the one that creates it all. And, and, and perhaps he's calling you this, this, this morning. He's saying to your heart, and he's been wrestling with you all along. And he's saying, it's time for you to come to me. It's time for you to admit that you, that you cannot do anything about anything. It's time for you to admit that you cannot get out of your fears by yourself, that you need me. It's time for you to admit that you have sinned. And because you've sinned, you fall short of his glory. And then believe. Believe that God has sent his one and only son to give you life, to give you a direction, to give you purpose, to rescue you from, from yourself and from your sins. And then confess him with your mouth. Confess him. Say, Lord, you are the Lord of my life. And let me remind you this, Christians, if you have made that, those, those three letters, A, B, and C, you have confessed Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And if he is the Lord and Savior of your life, perhaps this morning is the time for you to come and say, Lord, I've been fearful, and I forgot that you are the Lord of my life. Remember, remember. Do your business with God. Don't, don't just come here and hear it. Act upon the faith. Activate the faith. Don't just be God, hearers of God's word, but be doers of God's word. Perhaps you need to be like those 15 kids that came and allowed Jesus to rescue you this morning. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you. Thank you for being an awesome God. A God that is always on time. A God that's always present in the, in the midst of our fears, in the midst of our struggles, in the midst of our anxieties, in the midst of, of, of our storms, Lord, that, that you are always present, God. And Lord, I pray, I pray, Lord, that you remind us of this this morning. And we're so thankful for, for your rescue. And Lord, don't allow our fears to continue to keep us from re being restored by you this morning. Lord, if there's, if there's a person here this morning that needs to surrender their life to you, Lord, I pray that you, that you remove all the barriers, that you take away the things that keep them from coming, and Lord, that you allow them to come so that we can celebrate one more name written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Lord, we love you and we praise you in these things we do. In the powerful name of your Son, Jesus, amen. <laughs>
you so much. You can continue responding uh, to the invitation if you're online with us. First, you can 